writers Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnston were given the happy task of bringing three good fairies to life. At one point, Walt wanted the three fairies to all be alike, sort of like Huey, Dewey, and Louie. And we thought, that's not going to be any fun. So we started figuring it the other way and worked on how we could develop them and it's special personalities. I think it made a, uh, did make the picture richer to have them that way. Little Meriwether was a feisty little thing that get upset real easy. Fauna was always the one trying to say pour oil on troubled waters to keep peace between uh, Flora and Meriwether. Because Flora was not what you'd call the, uh, an appointed leader. She just automatically sort of became the leader because she had the best ideas. But all in all, the three of them formed a happy team. During the production of Sleeping Beauty, voice recordings and live action reference films were made by many of Hollywood's best known character actresses, including Spring Byington, Madge Blake, and even Mayberry's Aunt B, Frances Bavier. As animation progressed, another gift was being given to the production of Sleeping Beauty. My gift shall be the gift of song. Our inspiration for Sleeping Beauty was this wonderful score written more than 75 years ago by Peter Tchaikovsky for his ballet version of the fairy tale. Bringing much of this music to life was a lovely young singer whose performance as both the singing and speaking voice of Sleeping Beauty was the beginning of her career as a star of the international opera stage. They had searched for a voice for Sleeping Beauty for three years, and I feel that probably the reason uh, Walt Disney chose me to sing the part of the Princess Aurora was because I could easily negotiate my voice in the high register. And it was almost like an extension of speech for me because I'd sung that way since I was a little girl. I never lost that, and I know that he wanted everything to be in the Tchaikovsky uh, classical style, but he wanted it to be easily understood and warm and young and joyful uh, with a romance in it. And that's the way I felt when I was doing the music. Because of its strong reliance on classical music, Sleeping Beauty was recorded in state-of-the-art stereophonic sound. Similarly, its magnificent art and epic scope led to the decision to film Sleeping Beauty in the widescreen 70 millimeter format. Sleeping Beauty is the first full-length animated feature photographed in what we call Technorama 70. Our previous features like Snow White, Pinocchio, and Cinderella were made for the standard size theater screen. So they were shot on 35 millimeter film like this. But Sleeping Beauty was filmed in Technorama 70 like this. That meant that all of our artwork, backgrounds, paintings, had to be larger and more detailed. All of these special processes and meticulous attention to detail had a cost, not just in money, but in the time it took to produce Sleeping Beauty. In addition to the complexity of Sleeping Beauty's production, Walt Disney and his staff were stretched thin, hard at work on Disneyland, three television series, and numerous live action films. That's why it took us six years and six million dollars to make Sleeping Beauty. But to us, it was worth it. I mean, every, at, at every stage, at every step, this film was going to be different. And that meant much more work. This was not business as usual for anybody at the studio. The picture was in animation longer than any picture I'd ever worked on, and since then either. It was so complex in its uh, design statement that normally a background for a film might take a, a day or two. I think on an average for Sleeping Beauty it'd be at least a week, maybe 10 days sometimes. For myself, it was wonderful. I got to paint most of the production backgrounds of the whole picture, where it never could have been that way if it had been rushed. 
Sleeping Beauty premiered in the era of epic movies like Ben-Hur. But as was the case with many other epics, Sleeping Beauty was a gamble. Since it first opened, however, Sleeping Beauty has become one of the most financially successful films released in 1959, second only to Ben-Hur. And Sleeping Beauty has influenced a whole new generation of young people who have become the leaders of today's Walt Disney feature animation. I think it's something that our, our current generation of animators have taken greatly to heart in trying to make our current films uh, stylistically and graphically as different from one another as we can. It's a level of craftsmanship to which we can all still aspire. Sleeping Beauty is certainly ranks right there among the top most influential graphic films in the Disney canon. In my family, ever since I was five years old, I was known as the guy who wants to work at Disney. So we know who to blame. It's Sleeping Beauty and uh, those brilliant designers, and uh, it's Disney at its best. Little did I know, Sleeping Beauty would be the film that would keep me in contact with young people. When I'm talking to young people, tell them to hold on to their dreams. Work very hard. I, I was very lucky and so, so fortunate. It was a once upon a dream. And I loved every minute of it. Oh, <laughs> 